Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle, I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. I recently did a video talking about a shooting in Milton, Ontario. And just as a brief recap, a group of about five people broke into this house. They were armed with firearms. They attacked this guy's mother. Uh, the, the occupant there who lives with his mother manages to get a hold of a gun. He shoots one of the intruders and kills them. The intruders flee. He ends up charged with second degree murder. Now, in that video, I mentioned that I thought he had a very good self-defense case. And one question a lot of people were asking is, what if he's a bad guy? You know, what if he's not, you know, an innocent? And I did note in that video that I don't know if this guy is sinner or saint. I don't know if he's just sort of an ordinary, uh, you know, tradesperson or whatever, you know, just an ordinary citizen. He does have a firearms license, which leans in that direction, but that's not definitive, right? We don't know for certain. So people were saying, what if he's a bad guy? What if he's this guy, Scarface? And, you know, that this is some sort of criminal underworld activity. And the thing that may surprise people is that that actually might mean that he's got a better self-defense case than if he's sort of a random citizen. And so let's talk about that one, because I think this is something that a lot of people might find surprising. So let's have a look. To, we'll start off by looking at the criminal code. And you can see here, this is the defense of person section. So defense, use or threat of force. A person is not guilty of an offense if A, they believe on reasonable grounds that force is being used against them or another person, or that a threat of force is being made against them or another person. B, the act that constitutes the offense is committed for the purpose of defending or protecting themselves or the other person from that use or threat of force. And C, the act committed is reasonable in the circumstances. So already we can see how the sort of criminal scenario, the bad guy scenario, might actually make this easier to prove. Because if you've got a bunch of people who have broken into your house, one of the questions is how do you know you're under threat versus them being there to steal things? Now, from the reports in this case, apparently they were attacking the mother, which kind of lends towards the forces being used against them or another person. And if they're armed with firearms, okay, that seems to suggest that the level of threat is pretty high. But let's say they're just breaking in and they're still armed with firearms, but they haven't seen you yet. You know, they're looking around. It's a bit of a different scenario if you're sitting there going, well, I don't know what they're there for. Maybe they're there to take the TV versus I know that there are people who are out to get me because of my involvement in criminal activities. I believe that these people were there to kill me. It's reasonable for me to believe that because, you know, whatever you're doing. So in that sense, it may allow for somebody, you know, potentially to use force at an earlier stage if they are in fact a sort of bad actor. And then we have further factors that we can look at here. In determining whether the act committed is reasonable in the circumstances, and that's really the test, it's reasonable in the circumstances, but you have to look at a bunch of factors that will inform that decision. The court shall consider the relevant circumstances of the person, the other parties in the act, including, but not limited to, the following factors. A, the nature of the force or threat. As mentioned, um, criminals might be more aware that uh, something is intended as something violent against them. Whereas for a lot of people who are not involved in that, the activities of intruders or what they intend may be more difficult to pin down and articulate. Uh, you might be more vulnerable to a cross-examination that says, listen, you didn't know they were there to do you harm. All you knew is that they were there and maybe they're there to take your TV. And that may not justify force in the same way. So B, the extent to which the use of force was imminent and whether there were other means available to respond to the potential use of force. One of those other means that will always be brought up is, why didn't you call the police? Why didn't you wait for the police to show up? And Tony Montana out of Scarface has got a better you know, answer. Well, I didn't call the police because I'm sitting on a mountain of cocaine, like literally a mountain of cocaine in front of him. 
and I've got all these illegal weapons and so forth. I didn't want to call the police. So that might be, you know, and the court may or may not find that to be reasonable, but it's at least a reason. And, you know, whether the use of force was imminent. Well, again, if they're there to kill him, if he knows that they're there to do violence, that's going to weigh in that way in favor of that. C, the person's role in the incident. Now, this is kind of a broad and complicated topic, but fundamentally, the fact that you might be a criminal doesn't preclude you from using self-defense. But the person's role in the incident tends to mean more along the lines of, you know, did you start it? If you went into the bar and you were picking a fight, the court might be less likely to find later that your use of force in self-defense was reasonable if you were, you know, actively soliciting the conflict. But that's probably not going to apply if you just happen to be at home and people are raiding you because of your other activities. So this one's kind of a neutral one either way, although it might lean towards sort of the average citizen. Uh, D, whether any part of the incident used or threatened to use a weapon. Um, in this case, that's going to apply, you know, either way, but there were firearms on both sides. Uh, e, the size, age, gender, and physical capabilities of the, pers uh, the parties to the incident. So this basically is just kind of a, it, in some ways, this is kind of an, did you have other means question, right? Because... And we saw the other means available in B, but just if somebody is, you know, you outweigh them by 150 pounds, you've got a foot of height on them, and they can only walk with like a walker, uh, they might not be as much of a physical threat as, say, somebody who's much larger than you. Um, that's kind of how that weighs in. It's just could you have won the fight any other way is really what they're trying to get at there. Uh, F, the nature, duration, and history of any relationship between the parties to the incident, including any prior use or threat of force, and the nature of that force or threat. Now, this one can really weigh uh, in different ways. Now, you'll note that if you are sort of Joe Citizen in this, you know, sort of hypothetical scenario that you are a complete innocent, then there is going to be no nature, duration, and history of any relationship between the parties. It's just not going to be a thing. Um, but if you are, you know, a, a bad guy, then this might actually end up weighing substantially in favor of self-defense. This is a person who has tried to kill me before. This is a person who's threatened to kill me before. These kinds of things are a little bit more likely for the bad guy than they are for the uh, the complete innocent who's just sitting at home on their own, minding their own business when someone kicks in the door. And that can in turn possibly weigh the self-defense factors in favor of a bad guy. Uh, any history of interaction or communication between the parties to the incident, really the same kind of thing applies here, right? This is kind of the same topic. Uh, the first one might be a little broader in the sense that it might include other kinds of interactions within the relationship, but yeah, the same principles apply. G, the nature and proportionality of the person's response to the use or threat of force. Note, proportionality isn't a strict one-to-one -one thing. Uh, people often make this mistake when I see them discussing self-defense online. They'll say things like, well, they only had a knife, so it wouldn't be reasonable to shoot them or it wouldn't be legal to shoot them. You'd have to go find a knife of your own. Well, that's not actually how the law works. The law doesn't require you to sort of match one-to-one -one necessarily, but it does require there to be some sort of proportionality. Uh, as an example, let's say there's some guy who is spraying you with a super soaker, which may well count as an assault, right? They're assaulting you by spraying you with water. It's annoying. You don't like it. But they're not going to find that it's reasonable self-defense if you then pull out a handgun and shoot them and kill them. You know, that's not proportional to the threat you're facing there. Uh, you know, same as somebody's throwing crumpled up paper balls. You know, 
these kinds of things. Uh, but when you're talking about a lethal threat, it may well be re reasonable to even one up that or possibly substantially defend against that with, you know, if somebody's got a knife, it might be reasonable to use a shotgun. And I say might because this gets to be very context specific. And, you know, if somebody's got a knife and they're 300 feet away, you're probably not in any imminent danger. You would probably not be able to make a self-defense argument if you then shot them with a rifle. But if they run up and start getting closer, then your argument gets better. But here, I mean, in this particular case, we've got firearms on both sides. Um, that seems that seems proportional, right? And H, whether the act committed was in response to a use or threat of force that the person knew was lawful. So this is an important aspect, right? You're typically not going to be able to use force in the same ways if, you know, if you're being subjected to force that is lawfully imposed. And there's all sorts of circumstances where this might come up. Uh, so for instance, uh, let's say you are being ejected from a bar and, you know, the bouncer is guiding you out by sort of putting a hand on your back and walking you to the door and you turn around and pull a knife on them. That's probably less likely to be found to be self-defense because the force being used is lawful force. Uh, but there are circumstances where it might be reasonable for somebody to defend themselves even against lawful applications of force. Um, that gets into a really complicated kind of rabbit hole, so we're not going to go too much further down that one, especially because it doesn't really connect here, because when you've got people who are breaking into your house with firearms, that's not lawful force, unless they happen to, say, be wearing police uniforms and shouting out that they've got a search warrant. In that case, you're a lot less likely to be able to defend yourself against that bad idea, right? And there is actually an exception here for no defense, which says that it doesn't apply if the force used or threatened by another person. We'll just scroll that up here. Uh, for the purpose of doing something that they are required or authorized by law to do in the administration or enforcement of the law, unless the person who commits the act uh, that constitutes the offense believes on reasonable grounds that the other person is acting unlawfully. So if the police are trying to arrest you because they have an arrest warrant for you, um, you probably can't use any force to defend yourself against that. However, um, let's imagine the circumstance of the police are acting outside of their authority. You know, that you haven't done anything wrong and the police decide to arrest you and they're doing so improperly. Uh, they don't have any grounds to do so. You may be able to defend yourself, but this is almost never a good idea. So, um, again, not giving legal advice here, but just noting that as a, you know, as a thing here. So the... Uh, the sort of main point on this one, uh, Canadian criminal law doesn't prevent um, even bad actors, bad people, you know, who are involved in crime in various ways from engaging in self-defense. Somebody might be dealing drugs out of their house and still entitled to defend themselves against somebody who comes to rob them with a firearm or that kind of, that kind of thing, or somebody who's got a beef against them and wants to kill them. They might be entitled to defend themselves against that. That's not universal. There's plenty of places where you might actually lose your right to self-defense if you're involved in those sorts of criminal activities. And that's not what I'm suggesting here. A lot of people will be saying, well, why do criminals possibly have a better self-defense argument? I'm not actually suggesting that we should prevent people from having that. Rather, I think that if we're going, you know, because... I think that everyone should have the right to defend themselves against an unlawful attack. But if we're going to push our fingers on the scale on this one, I would do so by adding more to these factors to create a further presumption or a further kind of weighing towards uh, somebody who's acting lawfully. So we could perhaps add like, you know, 
factor I just to say uh, whether the person uh, involved was behaving or was acting within the law at the time or something along those lines. Um, that said, I don't think that this is enough of a serious issue that this would be top of my priorities for legislation in any way. I just think this is kind of an important consideration or an important discussion here because a lot of people were raising this and saying, what if this guy's a bad guy? It doesn't really affect my evaluation of the likelihood that they can get a conviction here uh, based on the little bit we know. Now, I'm going to be clear here. I don't know one way or another anything about this guy. Uh, we've got very little information. So I don't know if he's, you know, where he falls on the spectrum from like, you know, Tony Montana Scarface at the sort of far extreme one side versus, you know, complete innocent on the other. We just don't know at this point. That's going to be something that's going to be really interesting to look at, but doesn't really seem to affect the legal question. Now, where does it weigh in? Well, it might weigh in um, in terms of sympathy. I mean, people might be a lot less sympathetic about him, you know, in his circumstances if he turns out to be a very bad guy. And in particular, people might be less sympathetic to the question of why charge him right away and get him locked in a cell waiting for all of this. Now, I don't know. I mean, that's ultimately your personal judgment call. I, I don't know. I'm torn on this one. Quite honestly, I'm torn on it because I can see the arguments both ways. And one of my concerns on this one is just with respect to this guy's mom because I'm worried about what happens to her when she's left on her own. And what does that mean for, um, what does that mean for her? Is she going to be okay? Because I, I think that's a, a worry here. So yeah, um, I just kind of wanted to make this video to address this issue and this sort of question or criticism that's come up because it's a, it's a good question. It's a, perfectly reasonable question and it really gets into some interesting aspects of Canadian uh, self-defense law. I'm also working on a video on the GWAX uh, situation. There's been some really big developments. A lot has moved. This is basic. There's been basically an earthquake in the case that has really shaken a whole lot of things up. So I'm going to talk about that, but it's going to be a long video because the judge in that case has been very thorough, has issued a very uh, in-depth and exacting um, ruling, and I want to go through it in some detail in order to unpack it because I think it's important to, uh, to understand what's going on. This, I think, is a really interesting and important case, and so that'll be coming as soon as I can get it done. Anyway... Thank you for watching. I hope you found this to be interesting or educational. Please like this video. Please share it with your friends. Subscribe to see more content. I also want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, the CCFR, David Michaud, Canada's National Firearms Association, and the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. At the $30 level, Sites and Arms Limited and Jane Babe and Luxor. And at the $20 level, uh, Lindsay Metcalf, uh, Kyle Fox, Haywire, Gerald to the Bailey, Cameron Johnson, Andrew Elsich, and Vicky. Thank you as well to my $10 supporters who will be in the crawl immediately following. Thank you for watching. I hope this has armed you with knowledge. See you next time.